Okay. Well, I'm so happy to be here. I appreciate your invite very much, and I've got so much to do, but I know you're short time. Usually these things run two hours or more. We won't do that. I'll try to get out of here in an hour or hour and 15, but there's just so much that, that I need to, to share with you, uh, and I'll get right to it. I started my ham radio career uh, before I became an organist in 1952, my uh, my parents bought me a B3 Hammond, and I was 12 years old, and that was a very expensive thing, but uh, they somehow afforded it. And uh, right across the street from where I was taking lessons was Walter Ash, and I'd go over there and uh, nose around. And that was a few years earlier, but uh, I became a, a professional two years later, uh, playing in restaurants and so on. But in 1956, I became the substitute organist at the Fox Theater in St. Louis. Why I tell you this is that organ had not been played in 20 years. The organist there, Stan Can, he uh, tapped me to, to help him play substitute, but that organ hadn't been played in all those years. There's 3,500 pipes in that organ from one inch to 32 foot. They had to be voiced and tuned. It hadn't been touched in years. That is where little Bobby Heil learned to listen. And listening, is, it, it's a mental process. And a lot of people don't listen. They just hear. Okay, I hear it. Yeah. Mentally, you have to go in and dissect all of the nuances, all of the distortion, just things that happen harmonically. And I learned that as a young kid. Well, I went back to Walter Ash later in 1956. I bought a Harvey Wells. SX-99 in an RME converter. And you see, that is all gear that I used on six meters. Because when I entered this hobby in 56, it was the start of the largest sunspot cycle. I went nuts. I was working people all over the country with that Harvey Wells, and I still have it. There it is right down there. I use it each morning uh, on our uh, uh, 3885 AM net. But the station grew quickly. Of course, in those days, uh, uh, Gonsets ruled. But um, one night I'm listening around, I heard the most ridiculous signal ever. It, this guy had such distortion. I said, well, what is wrong with him? Came back next night. He's still there, or he was there again. And so I got up nerve to call him. And I, I, I could get some of his call out of there, but playing around with the receiver, I hit the BFO button, whoa, out pops a voice. It's that single sideband stuff that I've been reading about in QST. That, that guy was K0DGE, and he was the chief engineer at KMOX Radio, the big uh, clear channel 50KW. And um, I told him I come to St. Louis three or four times a, a week to play the Fox, but I have a lot of time. Uh, the movies went for three hours, and I'd play for eight minutes. So I, uh, I drove down to where he was. He gave me that address, and I bought, passed out when I, oh, my gosh, KMOX, and found out he was the chief engineer. And I asked him, I said, would you build me one of those uh, six-meter sideband rigs? No, I, I can't do that, but I'm going to teach you how. And he did. Gave me a laundry list. I went back to Walter Ash, bought a Central Electronics 10B kit, a, a grid dip meter, a milling grid dip meter. I still have it and still use it. And a bunch of parts to build a 36 megacycle oscillator mixer. What's 14 out of the uh, central electronics and 36 at six meters? Bingo. I was off and running. You'll see it over there in the lower left. I had built then uh, uh, the year after a Heathkit Seneca, bought a brand new dream receiver. I was doing quite well as a 15, 16 year old kid playing the, uh, the organ at the Fox. An interesting thing, you notice those two black boxes with the dials on them under the right. Those were B-29 transmitters. They were BC-458s. And Wes Shum, who brought single sideband to ham radio, he, uh, he taught us how to make a VFO out of that. Well, I needed a bigger antenna. I just had a little three element on the roof. And a Motorola dealer uh, locally, K9SGD, 
and canine uh, EBA, who was a contractor, they put up a 110-foot roan for me. My parents were very forgiving. They they had didn't have to spend any money, and all this went down. But notice that antenna. It's not all horizontal, and it's not all vertical. It was the new spiral array from Telerex. And what they were doing was trying to eliminate or reduce fading. Because when signals fade, it's not power, not always power. It's the fact that your antenna is changing, your signal is changing polarity maybe two or three times before it gets to the receiver. And this cut down a lot on that, and it, it really was helpful. Uh, also, uh, on the other side of the house, we put up a 50-foot a roan with two 36-foot-long 15-element uh, uh, two-meters. Notice one vertical, one horizontal. And I had read in QST how we could run those leads down into the shack. And by inserting uh, the uh, delay line, we could do some really cool things with phasing. Phasing became very important to me. I learned it first off from the West Shums Central Electronics phasing transmitter. Well, I, I, I really had a lot of fun, and with the big antennas and stuff, I, I knew I needed more power. So, back to Walter Ash, I bought a six and two Thunderbolt, put me out with a good uh, kilowatt and a half on six and two meters. It was a kit, and Larry Burroughs helped me, uh, helped me along the way. But I got a call from Bob Drake, W8CYE, are you the guy that's got that kilowatt on six meter sideband? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, we've been, uh, we've been reading about this and checked with the ARRL and we don't think there's more than six or eight of you guys. And we'd like for you to come and tell us how you did that. I, I would hope that Larry Burroughs would have went, but CBS wouldn't let him off. And so he said, we do this once a year. It's a technical meeting and we'd like for you to, to come and visit us. So I had a friend of mine locally and from Marissa, Illinois, that had a Bonanza airplane, and off we went to the Biltmore. They had taken all the furniture out of one of the floors, and they had all of the giants. These guys were celebrities to this little kid. Wes Shum, who brought single sideband to ham radio. No, it was not Art Collins. He was six years late to the party. Uh, Wes, uh, had, over the years, became a great friend and mentor. Oh, boy, was he a mentor for me. Bill Halligan from Hallicrafter. Carl Mosley, of course, from the Mosley. And, uh, but the J-Beam people were there, and they were looking for me as uh, they knew I had this uh, kilowatt on, on two meters also, and they said, we would like for you to do an experiment if we send over this antenna. I said, hey, why not? They sent over a 128 element two meter array, and again, the Motorola dealer and the uh, contractor, they helped me put this up. We had a spare lot beside our home and they put up a, a 40 foot uh, uh, tower and a 40 foot for the boom. Those are all old roans. And it had to be phased. That was all of the phasing harness and it was really something uh, to be able to do that. I worked a lot of things, early moon bounce and did a lot of experiments. There's a whole story about this. I'll come back and tell you sometime how NASA borrowed it. Um, the seven original astronauts would come into the restaurant where I was playing the organ at the Holiday Inn across the street from McDonnell Douglas. And uh, I had built a pipe organ in that restaurant. There we were building it. And Alan Shepard would come and sit on the bench with me. And, and uh, Wow, because he knew a lot about pipe organs. His father had a pipe organ in their home. He said, they wake me up every morning playing that thing. He said, I, and so he had a lot of fun uh, seeing what I had done to build this pipe organ in a restaurant. But anyway, I, uh, the fox had called me and said, hey, we're getting rid of some big speakers. We're taking out all the old 1930s. 32 sound system and why don't you come and get it so hey you know a ham doesn't throw anything away so i went and picked up those two big boxes actually there were four of them this is just the left side had a friend of mine had a fiberglass shop and we built some fiberglass radial horns for mid-range and uh 
tweeters from JBL. And I was just building a big hi-fi. And again, all of the things that you hear tonight is because of one thing, ham radio. It taught me so much. I barely made it out of high school. Barely. I only went the required number of days. And my grades were terrible. I didn't care. I was doing quite well, and I knew that for many years what my career was going to be. But underlying all of that is ham radio and learning to build things. Well, I built this sound system, but uh, a lot of the uh, local bands were coming to me because uh, they heard there was a guy with a soldering iron. <laughs> and so I was, uh, I was helping a lot of them with their amplifiers and so on. I knew nothing about rock and roll, nothing. I hardly knew who the Beatles were and, uh, in 1966, believe it or not. I learned pretty quickly, I must tell you, though. But um, I, got, I got tired of all this. I, I quit playing after the 12-year run, and... Um, was really diving into ham radio but i also had this sound system thing and the keel auditorium in st louis called me said hey, we urge you have a a large sound system and we need it we're in trouble uh, we've got an act coming in here and they're asking for bigger speakers and we don't have them that first show that i did at keel auditorium was Jimi hendrix i had no idea <laughs> what i was getting into uh, because i didn't I didn't know the music or anything like that. I had built um, a bass speaker for bass guitar players. Again, just fooling around as a ham. That's a 30-inch woofer from an Electro Voice Patrician Hi-Fi cabinet. Ye Old Music Shop was the name of my store in Marissa, Illinois, 50 miles southeast of St. Louis. And I was, I was really having a, a lot of fun doing some of these people. A lot of the country people would come up. Well... I got a call one day from the Fox Theater, and they said, hey, gave you those speakers a couple years ago. Did you get them to working? I said, yeah, I've done a couple of shows. Nothing's fabulous. Well, we have a disaster. What's wrong? I said, well, uh, hmm. this band came in here tonight, and uh, their PA didn't make it. The sound man was taken away last night on probation out of the state of California. He was one of the guys that invented LSD. The DEA and the FBI knew they were going to play the night before in New Orleans. They went and picked up him and the sound system. After the show, the band comes on to St. Louis. They didn't have cell phones. And so, bingo, <clears throat> up we go. Uh, he, uh, the stage manager, uh, he handed the phone to Jerry Garcia. And Jerry told me what, what had happened and, and asked me about this. I, well, we got Olsen Benz and a lot of JBL and Macintosh amps. And I'll never forget, he about yelled in the phone, at me, you have Macintosh amps? Nobody. I didn't know at the time. I just heard they were good. Well, we did the show. Not only did we do the show, there was uh, um, a journalist there that wrote a, a, a uh, an article called The Night Rock and Roll Sound Was Born, January 70 at the Fox in St. Louis. You go look this up. You can easily see it uh, by looking up in Google. He, the, the next week, he published it in Billboard about this, this little company, Ye Old Music from Marissa, getting the uh, contract for the Grateful Dead. Well, it just went crazy from there. And uh, fast forward by many years, we were the major sound system uh, for so many groups. And uh, I, I love doing it. It was much fun. I was, uh, and I'm a straight guy. I've never tasted beer to this day. I've never smoked anything. And for gosh sakes, did any other drugs. But they respected me for that because Pete Townsend always put it cool. He said he's got a soldering iron and the guy makes it sound good and he can drive the truck. And I did <laughs> sometimes. But I figured we got to do something about this touring. Um, they, they, they come in different Volkswagen cars and vans and half of the equipment didn't get there. Some of it didn't work. It was terrible. So, Street Man Heil, I uh, leased a 40-foot semi and a driver. 
bought an old Greyhound bus, had it totally restored, engine and all that, and we built 11 beds in there. And so we could sleep a lot of our roadies, and it saved us a lot of money. To kind of put a tap on the end of this, I had a manager call me. He said, hey, you're the guy that's got that big PA I'm hearing about. I said, yes, sir. Well, I got this new group, and they're really loud. You think you could handle them? I said, well, let's give it a try. This was their first job outdoors. That group was ZZ Top without beards. And uh, we, we formed a great relationship. We're still very good friends today. I build their microphones today, as I do for all of them. We got out of the sound reinforcement business. and uh, uh, But we were having great time as I put up a seven build a seven seven thousand square foot building we had 35 people working and uh, building amplifiers talk boxes and all kinds of things uh, and I, I was i was really having fun but then all of a sudden uh here came these rock festivals and um uh, you know, they'd tell you, well, we're only going to have like 10,000. Well, that one you just saw had 100,000. And I'd go, oh, boy. We handled it okay. But I got tired of that because I saw a lot of this. And I said, whoa, goodbye. So I, uh, I got out of that business in 1980. Of course, our, our friendship with Joe Walsh has been so strong all these many years. And it's all because of that. I don't have time. Have me come back. There's so much more you'll want to hear, I'm sure, after seeing some of this. How I built the talk box for he and gave one to Peter Frampton uh, for a Christmas present. That's his little gal, Penny. She was married in our home in Marissa and called me afterwards. She said, hey, I, I need a Christmas present for Peter. Don't send me a guitar. He's got a lot of them. So I sent Peter Frampton through Penny a talk box you can write the rest of his history well i get a call one day from paul klipsch i answer the phone that you heil i said yes sir who's this there's a clips here and i'm going oh my goodness this is god on the other end of this phone what can i do for you well i'm been reading about that multi-kilowatt system years i want to come and see it he was an efficiency freak he could do more with one watt the all in the speakers that he designed. He designed the corner horn where it was put in the corner of your room and the, la the, the eight foot one way and eight foot the other was the last of the 16 foot of the speaker cabinet. It was amazing. He, um, he flew me back to his home in uh, Hope, Arkansas that night after visiting all of our warehouses. That's an old telephone exchange building that was his, his lab. And... Um, he, he guided me to some studies of the Bell Labs, and I have to tell you, this was an important move in my, in my life. He, he, there were so many things that Bell Labs did, and I, I want you to follow some of that. You, it's easy for you. You can go to Google. I had to go to the library. Uh, Audio Encyclopedia was one of them. I should grab it for you. It's a book that thick. Uh, over a thousand pages and it's all about the early studies of the Bell Labs. Uh, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal was when they put the telephone system together, it didn't work very well. It was mushy. There was no clear speech articulation. What are they going to do? And here's a great demonstration of what that sounded like when they, they had two wires in New Jersey and all across America. Every 500 miles was a relay station to keep the voltage, the audio, everything up. Fine. When you got to California, what are you going to have? No problem. Oh, yeah. You're going to have a big problem because this is what they heard. This is a kind of audio. And they were just dumbfounded. What is wrong? So what they did is they put 4,000 scientists on this thing. And this is, uh, this is something I want you to go read about. They were dumbfounded by what happened. So what's going to happen? How did they know to do something? Had to do something. Because... When, the, when the, the phone company was hooked up 
coast to coast, this is what they saw. That's just what you heard. I took all the equalization off. There was no equalization in that day. So they brought the two leading scientists, and I would only hope that each of you know about the Fletcher-Munson curve, Dr. Harvey Fletcher and Dr. Weldon Munson. They, along with those 4,000 scientists, they were the lead scientists, they discovered about our ears. The human does not hear flat, and we need to have certain frequencies to understand things properly. Also notice, up at the top, the level is 100, 110 dB. It's almost flat. Bass, mid-range, vocals, cymbals. That's why kids like to listen to music loud, because they hear everything. Look down here where you're listening tonight at 10 or 20 dB level. What they discovered and we're talking about the 4,000 scientists, is the telephone system had to have a frequency response like this. First of all, it's only about 300 to 3,000. That sounds uh, interesting, similar to things that you talk into every day or night. Hmm? We're not six wide. Better not be and tell me about it. No, we're only 3K wide. Well, what they really discovered, Dr. Fletcher and Dr. Munson, was the fact that when you reduce, all I'm going to do, I'm going to take out that 2.5. I'm not touching anything else. I have a parametric EQ. I can change the parameters, and I just took out 2.5k and there you are you like that well if you get in the pile up you're not going to like it because you don't have articulation i'm going to put it back and pay attention to what happens here we have no essence of sound the f and the s and the p and the, they all sound alike and so as we start moving up the sound spirits are not there but all of a sudden, when 2.5 is on, ha-ha, now the S and the F, the essence of sound is so clean. And so it was there that they discovered the problem. Well, how are they going to fix it? There were no equalizers. Nobody ever heard of equalizers in 1920. But they did know about high-pass and low-pass filters. So what they did is on the phone system, they with the right equation and just a couple of parts, they could pass it through the high-pass filter, the, the right capacitor, and a resistor to ground to take some of the lows out. Or in a low-pass, they could pass all of it through, and the highs would go to ground. By mixing those up, they could create what the telephone system became and what it still is as far as speech articulation. 2.5K is the rise. Well, there was a young man. We should put a, a, a statue up to him. Look how young he was. That's John Volkman. John was working at RCA in the 20s. And he, his job was to do something to equalize motion picture playback systems because the talkies were out and in come these things called talkies. They had mm, speaking and he had to figure out how to do that. That was his job because it was all muffled. So what he did, he built a series of different low pass, different high pass, and he could take it into a theater hook it in series of the program source and the audio amp, switch it around and find out what components you need, solder it in place, bingo, 1930. Here's the scary part. Nothing, zero, nothing was done from 1930s. They'd already done it, that was it. About equalization, it was not in the language of audio until 19. 1967. Now, there was a small rise when the hi-fi movement came in somewhere around uh, the 50s. 
I, I know well, I was a, a, a young chap and I had a really nice hi-fi system and there was a, a little bit of EQ. All it was were those passive filters with a variable uh, resistor and that was it. But it was good. 1967, Langevin. This is a company that was building recording mixers. And Langevin really had a, a big deal going. They brought the first equalizer to, for professional use. It was a huge step forward. You know, that's the little knob on top. You could select a frequency and then boost or cut. This was a big deal. And uh, I'd heard about it, so I thought, I'm going to go to Langevin and see what's happening. They were in California, and I made a trip out there because I, I was on the on the way to to a Scully to build some uh, to uh, buy some Scullies for the Who, and uh, I went to visit them. And yes, I, I wow, wait a minute, they were building a mixer, an eight channel with slide controls. Now this was a miracle, because what we had before then, what I did the Jimi Hendrix and all, that's what it was. It was mixers that we got from the broadcast industry, and it's like, oh, my gosh, that's all we had, and we were thrilled to have it. Well, I walked into, in, in 1968, I walked into Langevin, and they're building this. I had to have a pair of them, so I did, and I had a carpenter in my hometown of Marissa. He built this nice wooden console for me. I had two of them in there. The two meters you see they were compressor and limiters but you see where that spot ironically when that picture was taken that little broad spot look what they brought out in 1968 we all went screaming whoa a graphic equalizer and i want you to pay attention where i had it all peaked out of course i did 2.5k and so we uh Heil sound we made some huge inroads because we were the only company that had this kind of equipment all because of my ham radio being able to listen from tuning those pipe organs it, it was it was just something to behold well i all of this the punk rock came in i said goodbye i'll see you later i didn't want to put up with those people they weren't nice people and i said see you later well i got back into ham radio of course i did hadn't been hadn't been there for about 12 years and uh, still had a lot of the old equipment and so on but things were happening then people would they're in marissa a small town of 2,000 people they were bringing me some cb radios to fix now, i don't want to know anything about cb radios but i got it looking i'm wait a minute i could build a little demodulator board because we still had some of our plants still there and we could build a little crystal bank and we could take change one crystal in a high gain cb bingo 10 meter fm then i heard that high gain was bankrupt and was selling so i called andy andros who owned it he said i do i have a whole trailer load of cb high gain boards they're tuned all the wires are on it but no chassis i bought them I don't know how many thousand, but I bought them. And through my club in Marissa, we started building 10 meter FM uh, kits. And then I put them on the market and it was my entrance to ham radio in 1976, 77, up through 80. And uh, you notice it's not high sound, it's called Melco, Marissa Electronics Company. Cause I didn't, I'm, I'm just still ham. I wasn't doing it. I had sold all of the sound reinforcement. I wrote the book and that book, I don't know how many thousand were bought, but a lot of people were changing their uh, CB radios around. ICOM came to me, Evelyn Goggin. She was the head of ICOM in uh, Seattle in those days. And she, she heard about this thing that I was doing. And so the 735 was the first commercial uh, radio, uh, ham radio, that had FM in it. And all because of that. Well, what I, I got really got into, I go, what happened to all my Art Collins audio? 
I mean, it was awful. And, 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 and I kept hearing things like this. Like, what is this? What? Distorted, not articulate. But then I did hear something. Uh, uh-oh, there is life. I said, okay, Heil, you got a job, buddy. We got to help these guys. Because I didn't know. But I started researching the fact that hmm, there was nothing like an equalizer in ham radio. So I built for myself a little box. I called it the EQ200. I thought, whoa, this is fun. I had a bunch on 40 meters every night we'd get in, and about five or six of us, and they kind of helped me figure out what to do as far as the, the different filter frequencies. And it was very simple. 160 hertz on the low end, you can increase, which you never want to do, and decrease it, notch out some of that bass. But where was the top end? If you don't know, I really, really did not do my job earlier. It's 2.5K. Bang! Yes, this became a big hit. But I wrote an article for QST, and they called me, said we want to we want to publish that article. We're going to clean it up a little bit. It's going to be the lead article, and you will receive our cover award. Well, now wait a minute, cover award? Hmm, I don't know about that. It was. I made one mistake. I put my phone number in there. I, I did this as a, D, D, a DIY. You build it yourself. I had all of the all of the details, all of the parts list. A lot of guys, we want to build it. We want it now. We want it right now. So I called two of my best solder solder gals. They were still uh, still in town, and we opened up a portion of the sound reinforcement plant. We still had our. Uh, uh, some of our pinned circuit board stuff there. And so away we went. Built thousands of EQ200s. In 1990, uh, 1999, I'll forward this a little bit. We got to get moving, Heil. <laughs> In 1999, Dr. Inouye called me. Inouye Communications, ICOM. He, he had a picture of his, his station. It was one of the great... IC781s, you guys remembered, it was one of the wonderful uh, contest rigs of the day. He said, I'm thinking of new radio. And here he had that IC781 and my Goldline microphone and my EQ200 was in his station. So we got together with him and working with his new radio, the Pro 1, the Pro 2, the Pro 3, all the way through the ICOM line. Yeah, even to uh -huh, this little guy. And I bet you guys all have one of these. This is the coolest little thing ever, the little 705, 5 watts, battery operated. Yes, it has all of the things that a 7300 has. My e equalizer's in there. It's all in in this little box. It's a 7300 in a little box, but it's got D-Star and two meters. Aha! So it's a lot more. We started working with him. And so in 1999, we came up with, uh, with the equalizer for all of his radios. The problem is, a lot of the guys, they weren't adjusting it. They were leaving it in the default mode because the instructions aren't very good. Well, our uh, web uh, website started up about then, so we started helping people. I'm going to show you how easy it really is. Here's an ICOM 7300. What an amazing piece of gear. Did I say it's the best? No, I said it's amazing, but it's pretty darn close to the best. The first thing you do when you sit down to a radio is just the TBW, the transmitter bandwidth. I set it at 100 to 2900 because we're going to do some rag chew. When you do that, you want a wide excursion. 
and this is it. That's all the wider you can get, and it's beautiful. But now you're going to notch out some bass. That's a 160 uh, hertz filter. You can't change that, but you don't have to. I already figured it out. All you want to do is minus it two or three, and the trebles at you know where 2.5 K, and you know what happens when you have 2.5 K and it's flat and you put 2.5 back in at plus three, this is what happens. So this is very easy to operate, easy to adjust, and uh, all, all of the ICOMs are very simple. They have different looks on the graphics, of course, but we don't, uh, you know, we'll go all through these. They're the same thing. Uh, minus two on the base, plus three uh, on the treble. So all of these things happened. Uh, uh, ICOM also asked me to build them a proper microphone. They don't build their own microphones. They're OEM things, and most of them aren't right. Oh, it came in the box, hi, it's got to be nice. Yeah, right, got their name on it, okay. Well, why did they ask me to build one? Because they knew it would be bright. The ICM, I named it almost spells ICOM, and it really is something special. How do you adjust your mic gain? By watching the ALC meter. Do the books tell you this? Not really, but there's your ICOM fix. Well... A year later at Dayton, Dr. Hasegawa, his family owns Yesu, comes into my booth. Big tall guy. I want to do this better. Uh, uh, what are we talking about? EQ. I do it better. Uh, okay. That would mean a parametric. Ah, that'd be good. I No. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What be the problem? Education. You see, with the two band EQ, uh, you just have to plus or minus. That's it. With a parametric, you are the engineer. You have to figure out what frequency, what bandwidth, and where to put it. And the parametric I designed for Yesu, the first one was a 9000, my very favorite radio. What a wonderful piece that is. There's three filters in there, three parametric filters, and each one of them has three controls, meaning you have nine buttons. Think about this. You have to know what to do, where to set these nine. And you want to look at their uh, manual? <laughs> I, I, I designed it. And I look at all this. I'm going, oh, what is this? I can't make it out. But you sure can make it out of this. This is on our website. Very simple. Let's take the first filter. 200 on the low end, minus three or four on the level. And the bandwidth is two octaves. Don't question the octave. Just two or three will be fine. We'll touch that in a minute. What's the next filter? I'm going to set it around eight or 900. Why? All of the many shows I did in these arenas, there's something about sound in your studio, in your wherever. Do this to your ears while you're talking, and you'll hear that boxy sound. We want to get rid of it. Okay, let's get rid of it. Let's set it at eight, nine hundred, minus three or four, two octaves of bandwidth. But where are you going to put the third one? You know where to put it, 2.5K plus eight. Was that difficult? Frequency level width, frequency level width, frequency level width. That wasn't difficult. Now, before you get too far, you have to set the bandwidth. I usually set it at 200 to 3,000 up at the top. And there's one other thing about Yesu. You have to save those settings just like a computer because it is a computer. And so you have to hold in the program button for a couple of seconds and it'll tell you it's saved. And so this is all simple stuff. It's on our website. It's so easy. You can, I want you to go there. There's so many things. We talked about that bandwidth. You see, at two, that bandwidth is where that wide, that red is. You can go up to four or up to eight. It gets narrower. I always just use it like two, it's okay, but that's how you can narrow that bandwidth. I also built microphone, dynamic microphones for the Kenwoods, the Ella, Ella Crafts, 
and the Yesus. These are beautiful, full-range dynamics. The podcaster Dream Mike, as well, it's become exceptional for ham radio. And I also, what I'm talking in tonight is a PR-22. I was commissioned by Paul Rogers, a bad company, to build this for him because he wanted a microphone that was very articulate. It has a 4 dB rise at 22K. And you can tell I, I, there's no EQ on this. And it's very articulate because I learned from the scientist we need to elevate to five, so I did. And the proper settings on all these things are very important. And a lot of people just don't pay attention. And one last little bitty thing before we get into the real meat, <laughs> if that's not good enough, what do you do about vintage gear? You got a bunch of vintage gear, okay, hey, what about it, Heil? They don't have EQ. Yeah, none of it do. Well, you go to Julius Jones. He's got a really nice equalization system. And uh, Sergi, you are 6QW. And very, very easy to understand. And transmitter bandwidth. This is very important. And a lot of people don't understand this. There are some radios that are only 2.4 wide. And so they buy a PR40 or a 781 or anything else. They'll call me and say, that microphone's terrible. I can't get any bass out of it. Yeah, well, that's, uh, wait a minute. It's not the microphone. It's your filters. Take a listen to this and you'll see what I'm talking about easily. Any idea we're transmitting a 2.9K with... This is 2.4K. And as you note, it's nice and it's articulate, but the whole bottom end drops out because of the filter network. We'll go back to 2.9. Now this is the, uh, the 2.9 and it's much smoother has much more fidelity. And so therefore you have to understand what you're going to do. And, and another thing about all this is bandwidth. Now, if you're in the contest mode, we want to pay attention to that. Very much so. Because that bandwidth is so important. If the air in this balloon was RF, and you set this to 2.9, and you had a little rise, we had, remember we had a little plus three rise, nothing gigantic, on a 2.5. And that's nice for right you. Hey, I want all the power I can get at 2.5. I proved it to you several times. So you're going to narrow it up. You're going to do 500 and you're going to do 2,500. But you opened the door, the only door, on that 2.5 equalizer. So the only escape for your RF, because you're shortening it up here, is going to be 2.5. And when you do that, guess where your RF is, folks? This is not some kind of thing. Nothing is, nothing I told you tonight is Bob Heil. I learned it from the scientists, and I'm just passing it on to you. And for gosh sakes, I hope you can pick up some of these things because they all mean so much to us, but I don't read about them. That's why I think this one tonight is number 251 of these presentations, and some of them go for two hours. They won't let me go. And some of them I'm coming back the fourth time because we want to focus on one thing, and I'd love to do that with you. So there's so many things. In 1984, the North California DX Association called me and said, we want you to build us a headset with that new element you have. What are they talking about? I came up with the HC4s. You guys remember that. The Dream Machine, look at that. A 10 dB spike at 2.5. It's the most ridiculous sounding thing in the world, but look where all your power is. And it, 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 was, it was just wonderful. And I, I don't need to tell you guys this. Gosh, I hope I don't. Everybody needs a scope. You can go to a ham fest and buy one for 30, 40 bucks, but how do you hook it up? Ah, that's simple. You buy a little box you can get from them Hammond or go to Antique Electric Supply. They got a bunch of them. You take two coax connectors and the center 
of a piece of RG8, leave that milky stuff on it if you want. Just connect those together, nothing else. But you tap the input with a 51K and a 680 to ground. And at the middle of that voltage divider, you put a 0.04 out to your scope, bingo. It is, without a doubt, without a doubt, the most useful thing in your station and you really need to pay attention because it, it, it means everything to be able to figure out what you're transmitting. The other thing is how to use a microphone. I know I, well, first of all, I want you to go to my site, heilsound.com. There's about 50 pages under the support page, all things ICOM, all things Yesu, all things Kenwood, all things Elecraft. It's all important to you. And, uh, we want to be sure that uh, that some of your answers are are, are, are answered. Uh, some of your questions are answered. Uh, our microphones all have power focus, thanks to Joe Walsh. Joe said, "I want a microphone that I don't have to be stuck in front of all the time." What, what's what's he talking about? Well, you know what he's talking about when I show you this. You've seen the entertainers. Oh, what happened to my audio? I didn't change anything. <laughs> yeah, and do um, you want to use this microphone? I don't think so. Okay, but here's what Joe didn't like. He, you see them? They got to stay right here. They can't move because if they move off, it's gone. Well, he wanted it to move around. So... What I did, and I learned a lot of this from the scientist again, about omni patterns. All other microphone companies have an omni pat. They have an omni microphone, but it's all it's all the way around. No, we just want it on the front. We want to learn about power focus. I learned that from antennas. A lot of my audio uh, designs came from all the antennas I got into. But now the uh, this microphone that you see, the PR-22, and most of them, it's 180 degrees. If you, sh if you close your eyes, you'd never know I was moving around. You're not going to do that with any other microphone. It's very important. The broadcasters all really got hip to it. Entertainers got hip to it because they didn't have to they stay stuck right in front of it. Sirius Radio just bought 250 of our PR40s, put their RE20s away. That blows a lot of people away. Oh my God, that's the best microphone ever. No, it was 60 years ago. Recording studios. All of these wonderful, wonderful professionals are used. That, it's all about the microphone. Even Mickey Mouse uses a whole bunch of them. We were very involved in last main standing. And so, it means a lot when we we see all of this happening, and uh, boy, I'm running out of time. Let me. Uh... Joe wanted me to build him a microphone. Oh man, I got, <laughs> I got a lot to gain on this thing. He wanted me to move a micro a microphone he can move around, but he also wanted to get rid of the rear rejection. How are you going to do that? Nobody else did it. Watch this screen and listen. This is 40 dB down from the rear. Oh, it still works, but it's 40 down. So we don't pick up all this nonsense around us. And it, it really has been wonderful to be able to help the broadcasters and all the people from the recording studios, from many, many of the big professionals. And they're, they're using the PR40s. And I did it all because of phasing. Phasing is so important to me. And I, 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 this is a whole hour on itself, but I'll try to run through this quickly. How did, how did West Shum get rid of the carrier? when he brought out the, the, all of his central electronic stuff uh, six years before anybody. Well, he did it because of phasing. 
how do you get rid of the other sideband? How's your notch filter work? When some idiot piles on top of your frequency and doesn't care about you, you push the notch filter, he's gone. How's that happen? You're yaggy. How does that happen? Does anybody ever pay attention to some of these? Well, I did as a, as a kid and... spending a lot of time with with the uh, uh, the engineers in their work I, I I read these books amazing for a, a good five years I learned so much these two microphones are exactly alike a PR 22 this one I have a Y cable this one's in phase when I speak it goes down the diaphragm this one's out of phase sounds just like the other one they're both alike but this one I have a magic little plug in here and it's backwards it's out of phase pin three to two and two to three and so now when I speak in this one it comes up what happens when you take two signals out of phase together watch the screen nothing nothing oh my gosh I love this subject and I know I'm not going to be able to even touch on it but I just wanted you to see that because From that, we, we need to talk about antennas. I always wanted to do a phased array. And I, uh, I was in the Ozark for about eight years, and I, I built a phased array. Talked to Tim Duffy a lot, a lot of other people that had them, and I figured, we can do this. So I did. Called the telephone company. They brought out two uh, poles they had cut off. They give them to me. You can do that a lot. They want to get rid of them. Here we go, 65, uh, 64 foot high, 64 foot apart. The delay line ha had to be 43 foot, and the two down leads had to be 0.66 velocity of 213 at 126. Now, when I switch to the left, that's the driven. But look what happens. The reflector is delayed, and that's where we get our are fantastic, are fantastic rejection. And I think you'll love this. 75 meter phased array antenna system consisting of a pair of coaxial dipoles mounted atop a pair of 55 foot telephone poles. We put them in an inverted V fashion and the poles are 64 foot apart. These are 500 foot from the operating position fed with RG213. In order to make the antennas directive from east to west, we use a delay line of 43 foot here on 75 meters that's switched in and out of the driven element, either east or west. The down lead length is 126 foot. We take all of that coax, the down lead length, the 43 foot phasing delay line, and mounted them in a container, one of the plastic container boxes that we actually buried and just the top of it shows it's all sealed so it's waterproof but that's the way we get to switch f all the components from 500 foot using one of the Amatron RCS 8V remote switches it really works well take a listen to how we can get at least 10 to 20 dB difference east to west people do I mine's usually three inches or so did you know that's just after you didn't mow it and uh, I know you know probably uh, uh, you know we get a dry day I'm, I'm gonna have to lay out there and mow that's just all there is to it because you know if you leave it that high when it starts growing any at all it's looking right or it gets looking ragged pretty quick so uh, it's, uh, it's to that point now. and uh... The system really performs on weak signals. Take a listen as we switch to the direction they're coming from. Also note, the preamplifier makes no difference on 75 meters on this signal. The preamplifier, of course, make the meter read higher. But in many cases, the preamplifier does not cause the weak signal to be more readable. Check it out. Yeah, well, I see they introduced. 
boy on it, and uh, I don't know if that is their form of uh, portal, portable, or what that is. Uh, you why? No question, no argument. It's an amazing thing. I wish we had many more hours. <laughs> There's so much you can do with antennas. And, and you can do it, of course, with verticals very easily. Same setup. Uh, just do your phasing lines. Uh, I used uh, Ameritron f uh, for my 75. For my 40 meter, I used a DX Engineering. But I hate rotary switches. I hate them. I hate them on even some of my vintage gear. I put the real true levers on them. I go to Antique Electric Supply. I do hope that you guys know about this. Antique Electric Supply is amazing. They have all kinds of parts. And I bought Les Paul guitar switches. And now, east to west for 75, east to west for 40. And uh, right behind me on uh, this station, there's 35 relays behind me and all this stuff. I, I have a whole thing. I'll come back some night and show you how that works. It's, an, it's wonderful. And so... I have uh, all the antennas that you see, but the, the colored ones, uh, they allow me uh, to uh, switch to different radios. But um, the, phase, the phasing things can be done in-house, uh, run the, the, the lines in and do them with a switch. All really good stuff. One of my good friends, K8MN, some of you might know him, Dave Heil, no relation. Uh, he did a 20 meter one with a piece of two by four on top of his tower. It worked great. Of course, you had to have all of the other things. I should hope, I should hope you know about this. I didn't until many, many years later. A publication from Collins Radio stated the most transmitting antennas of resonant dimensions elevated at a quarter wave above ground or as close to 100% efficiency as possible. I thought, I'm going to play with that. So I did. We had about, I don't know, five or six guys. I had a resonant antenna on 40 meters. There was a reference antenna. One night I came up, every night I had a different antenna. Came up at 20 foot and we checked that out. Okay, let's go up to 40 feet. Let's go up to 50 feet. Got worse. Okay, let's take this. When I went to 33 feet, whoa, there was more signal. I went to 66 feet, there was even more. You guys all know about this. I should hope you do. And it, it, it's just a miracle. And I'm, this is kind of stupid to talk about here. I'm just rushing through here, but... Uh, a lot of the guys that have been in long, I don't like pulleys, I hate them. I use carabiners. They never freeze up, they never lock up. They work great. I make my own center uh, uh, insulators, just a piece of fiberglass, drill some holes. It works great. I got to show you an antenna. There's all kinds of other things. You guys all know about this. And of course, my favorite of the dipole is the MIT coaxial, not a bazooka. The real live MIT, they designed it for the radar, a broadband antenna for the war in 1938. That thing plays. And um, I have a guys talk about their ladder line stuff. It's hard to use. In the Midwest where it snows, oh, it changes. Uh, yeah. Forget it. Here you go, man. You want to do this. This is the way to use balance lines. You take coax, any kind of coax. You short this up at the antenna. You short the sleeves, the, the uh, shields together. The centers do not touch anything but the two leads left and right, plus or minus. Down in the station, short the shield again, take that to ground, and run it through a ballon or your tuner. You put up a 120 or 30 foot antenna, you can work every band you want. And so, one of my friends in Kansas City, he, he had a problem. He's gonna do it in an, in an attic, and he did this, two meters to, to 80 meters. Look how he did this. This is amazing, and it really works. 
uh, it's, it's a major fan dipole, and all of the leads are well-defined and tacked into the uh, right uh, places in the attic. And for all the doom and gloomers, well, you want to check this out on 40 meters, also on 75. They really are quite flat because he cut them to resonance. The six meter one he cut and it's real narrow, but he only wanted it for his repeater uh, to listen to. So you see, they're just all of these things you guys and gals know about it. I get really, ugh, I get really frosted about SWR. I live for 25 or 30 years without an SWR meter. Who cares? Resonant antennas, and then you're going to be pretty close. Hey, if you want SWR, put your darn dummy load up on the tower. <laughs> oh, golly. Oh, I'm going to have to move on. I do want to tell you this. I got flamed for years and years and decades and decades. That KMOX engineer, about two weeks into this hobby, taught me how to do coax connectors the right way. You cannot ensure soldering through those little holes that you have it all connected. And if you say, well, it don't matter, it all kind of molded. No, we want every one of those little suckers soldered. Well, I didn't talk about this much to anybody. If you didn't do an RG58, don't, don't do this with it on it. You're going to melt it. You want to you put that in a vise and heat it up and really put some solder to it when it co coil, uh, cools down, then you go ahead and you solder it together and you won't hurt anything. For years, I, I had this all going. Never showed or talked about it until about eight years ago, I visited K3LR. 11 of the contest stations, the biggies, you know him, I look over in the corner, and here's all of these coaxes. There must have been 60, 70 of them. And I went over. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. They're all done like this. I said, Tim, you're my savior. He said, what are you talking about? I said, all my life, man, I haven't talked about this because everybody made fun of me. You can't make fun of that. You cannot guarantee the way the AWR will do you how to do it. How do you bring a coax into a room? Before this tile was set down here, uh, I, on the plywood, I put a, t a toilet flange. When we put the tile down, this is what we did. And it really works great. You don't have to bring them through a window or any of that nonsense. But uh, just all kinds of wonderful things. and. I don't even have time to talk about the pine board experience. Come back and talk about that some night. That's a fabulous thing where we, we have over a thousand people that have built these rigs and are uh, all breadboarded 75 and 40 meter things. Incredible stuff. Because I want to talk about what happened a few years back, three to be exact. I'm really sick and tired of what's going on with receiving. And I work for these companies, okay? I'm inside their plants, but on the transmitter end. I ask them, why don't you do something with the receiver? Oh, we can't do that. No, our receiver's great. They're talking about sensitivity select. I'm talking about audio, distortion, high distortion. Everyone, even your $15,000 one has a little one or two watts at 10% distortion, but you've never seen it because they're embarrassed. They will not publish that. You've never seen it on audio. Oh, we're really proud of our selectivity. Yeah, what about your audio? Well, it's okay when I fr could front them. So I did something about it, and I did it in a big way. It took me some years, but you guys and gals were a big help because you asked me to do some things. And did I? It, it was it, it was something to, to do this because I wanted to I wanted to do things that would help people. It's a parametric equalizer for receiving. So what we do is we we come into this with the normal it's, it's three band the normal uh, bass and treble. You can set up the, uh, uh, the plus or minus twelve dB. But I wanted to get more out of it 
So I came up with, as you see there, a parametric in the mids. And that parametric allows you to be the engineer, and therefore you can adjust just as I did a while ago on the microphone. So here's the whole story. This is how it all happens. Input control. Then we have our highs, plus or minus. That's at 6K. Then we have the lows at 160 hertz. I'm going to minus that. But here's the biggie. We have a filter that's a parametric. We're going to set them. There it is flat. We're going to set a little gain. And we can go from 400 to 4,000. We're going to come back to that. But here's where a lot of you came into view. You asked me for a long time. Build a headphone amplifier that works. You see, headphone amplifier. And most, uh, external speakers are a joke. I can't believe you've been fooled all these years. They're just chintzy, ch ch cheap little things. No. The headphone amplifier is serious. These are separate line amplifiers, not some kind of Y chord. And we can have a logger in this guy and an operator in this guy. But the biggie that's happening is you can put the left side speaker here of your headphone and the right side here. And if you have a hearing imbalance, wow. I can't tell you how many of these are being sold for televisions and computers. I never thought about it but they are. This one is a separate line out for recording. Plug that into your computer, bingo. I have some recordings, and I want you to take a listen what we can do with some really tough audio. I gotta come over here and crank it up a little bit, and I think this is all gonna work. I've had some real problems lately with it. And it's probably not going to work tonight. I bet you it isn't. Oh, my goodness, it's not. Well, anyway, I want you to go to my website uh, and, and look at the parametric equalizer. Because the parametric equalizer is something every one of you need. Because you can do with it just what I did with the microphone. And the contest guys are finally saying, oh, wait a minute, how come we haven't had this before? That's what I asked myself when I started this project. I'm sorry this didn't work. I don't know what's going on with that. But anyway, go to my website. And plus, we just, we're just pretty much out of time. But I, I want you to do that. Go to my website under Parametric Receive. And when you do, you'll buy it. If you're a serious contester for headphones, you will buy it because you don't have anything in your station that'll do that. And it's so important. Oh, my goodness. It is so important. And uh, we're always here to help you. I, I, uh, I, I sometimes will go through 50, 60 emails a day. Uh, you also might want to check into my handbook. I didn't write it. I compiled it. Larry Burroughs. The scientists, Paul Klipsch, all of these great mentors of mine. I just use their notes that I've collected all these years. Go to my website. You can download this for free. It all starts with the microphone. And uh, a few years back, Heil Sound was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We're the only manufacturer there. They have quite a display. That mixer is what I did the Who uh, Quadrophenia with. It's a quad mixer. There's only one in existence that we built for them. And on the other side is ZZ Top's mixer, uh, the, the monitors. We brought monitors to that because of antenna theory. I uh, know, what are you talking about? <clears throat> Phasing, because monitors feed back, but I figured out how not to get them to feed back. And the first talk box signed by Peter Frampton and Joe Wasser there too. And a few years back, I received an honorary PhD from Mizzou University for music and technology. Understand, this is a kid that barely made it through high school, but I learned it all from ham radio, and it's exactly why I'm here tonight. I want to pass this on. And I'm really thrilled to be able to be with you. I'd love to come back. Give me a subject. You've seen what's going on. I'm, I'm always here for you. 
If you got a problem or a question, don't be shy. Write me, call me, we'll get on Skype, whatever. I hope you have some questions that we could go through. Bet you do. Anybody's got any questions, go ahead and come off mute and ask them. I don't have a question, but uh, Bob, we met at uh, Visalia a couple of years ago, and it was a great trip down memory lane about Walter Ash <laughs> and, the, and the Fox. I, I, I grew up there, lived there for 29 years. <laughs> great, great days, my friend. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We're still playing the Fox. It was all closed for a year and a half, but uh, finally getting to open it back up so we'll get to play the big organ before the shows again. Excellent. So we're, any others? Bob, uh, in the background. Good, Bob. Yeah, could you hear me? Yeah, yes. go ahead. Yeah, okay, Bob. K7 BHM, it's always a pleasure to work you on six meters when you get down to the Ozarks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did that last summer. It was, yeah. you really shocked me uh, when you came back to my CQ. Yeah. Always good to hear you on six. Well, I love six meters. Unfortunately, it's become a contest band. It's either <laughs> FT8 or, and this really gripes me. You call a station, what's your grid square? What's your grid square? Goodbye. Come back here. What kind of transmitter do you have? Where are you? What's your grid square? I'm gone. When they get your grid square, they don't want to talk to you anymore. They can't have a conversation. It's how Bob Heil learned all this from all of the years I was on six meters, exchanging ideas and learning and having friends. You can't do that on six meters anymore. And I'm really sad about that because I was a six meter freak for about, I don't know, 12, 15 years. I don't even get on it much anymore. I listen around, but. But uh, nice to hear people that we can have his conversation. I know you're going to say, he's he's crazy. Well, I already know I'm nuts. <laughs> Anybody <laughs> running around with Joe Walsh and Pete Townsend? <laughs> Either way, thanks for the cue again. I appreciate it. Yeah, excellent. excellent. Uh, do you have any other uh, pine board projects in the pipeline? Yeah, I've got a final that I'm working on. Yeah, I do. I do. And... Uh, so we could check that out. Hey, I just, I'm going to, oh, I just got this working. What happened? My mixer died. I'm going to go back and, you got to hear this, because you guys need this. Here we go. Here it is flat. Here it is flat, the way you hear it. It's flat. It is flat. That's the way you hear him. Do I have to say anything more? <laughs> you can imagine what happens when you plug in a pair of these. If you don't own these and you're a serious contester, that's the key right there. So I was glad I got, I got to figure out what happened. Any other questions? No. Hey, Bob, it's John N7 NWL. I've got three pages of notes that yeah. I've never done before on one of these. So I will be going to your website. Okay. Remember, please don't be shy. Send me an email. We'll get on Skype or Zoom. And don't, don't just pass it on. That, that's what I do. That's, that's my job at Heil Sound these days. Yeah, I'm the CEO. What does that do? You know, I got my normal things. But I love to help you. And there's nobody doing it at this level. So... Let's do it, man. And let's come back here and focus on a subject. I'll be there for you. So I'll be looking forward to hearing from you.
Yeah. Hey, Bob, this is K7HI. Yeah. I just put your website on a chat room, so the link is there. Okay. Islesound.com. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. And this my call at ARRL makes it. Get Bob, that have, you, have you done any uh, any organ uh, con concerts recently, like you did uh, on the West Coast a few years ago? Oh, yeah. I, I play locally here every Friday uh, at a local theater, but I'm doing them on Zoom. All I have to do is walk about 10 feet in front of me, and there it is. In fact, that's how I end these things. You have two ways to go with me. You can cancel out the old Zoom, or I'll walk over there and play a two-minute video on the end. What, your choice. Video. Play us off, Bob. Okay, you want to do that? Yeah, play it out. Okay. Hey, thanks so much, everybody. It's just wonderful to be able to be here. And uh, I love sharing this hobby. And let's come back and do some more. So thanks, Bob. Have, Great presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Bob. Great, great to have you. Thank you, Bob. Wow. You're a big influence in my life. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, thanks so Bob. Much. Thank you. Thank you, so you Bob. Great presentation, Bob. I have to say, what a pro. <laughs> Bravo, bravo. You do this every day. I think I have that on a 78 RPM record.